Well, today is Palm Sunday. It's when we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, the, the Jews thought he was coming for a completely different reason. They were celebrating the coming of an earthly king. But Jesus was coming as our Savior. He came to give his life for us, to show us the love of God and how we can triumph in life. And so here's how Luke records that experience. It says, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany in the, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. So what are you willing to throw down for Jesus? Will you let him ride as king in your heart? People in Jesus' day were so poor that the average family couldn't own their own donkey. What usually happened is that several families went in together to, to buy a colt they could share. And so when the owners of this colt are told by the disciples, the Lord needs it, they don't even protest. They don't ask how, the, how long the colt's going to be gone or what it's going to be used for or any of those kinds of questions you would think would be asked. They give up their donkey freely. How willing are you to give up your life for Jesus Christ for what he wants and what he needs from you? You see, God deserves your very best. All God really wants of you is to give your best for him every day. So will you be the best you you can be for him? Well, in August 2003, the Church of the Holy Cross in New York City was broken into twice in the same month. The first time, thieves took a metal muddy box that was sitting next to a votive candle rack. Three weeks later, they unbolted a four-foot-long, 200-pound Jesus off of a crucifix on the wall. As one church member said, they just had decided, we're going to leave the cross and take Jesus. We don't know why they took just him. We figure if they wanted the crucifix, you should take the whole thing. In other words, what he was saying was, if you want Jesus, you need to take his cross too. Living for Jesus is really a dangerous kind of thing. Believe me, you're in no danger if you don't take up the cross. Many people claim to love God, but refuse to take up the cross. God doesn't want you to just have Jesus come into your life and, and that's it. He wants you to live courageously and powerfully for him. That means letting him have all of you. That means not only is he your savior, but he's the Lord over your life. That means you're giving him the very best that you have. So how do you give God your very best? Well, we're going to learn from three metaphors Paul uses in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 7. This is what he says. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets tied up in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. And the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Think about these three illustrations, and the Lord will help you to understand how they apply to you. And so we're going to look at these three different examples to see how, how we can be our best for God. How, you know, the Lord needs you, how you can give yourself to Him. So let's talk about some lessons that we can learn from military. One of the slogans we often hear from the army is, be all that you can be. It reminds me of a story uh, about Admiral Hyman Rickover. He was the father of America's naval nuclear program. 
he was recruiting some sailors from the Naval Academy to serve on one of his nuclear submarines. One young cadet came in and he sat down. And here's how that cadet remembers that conversation. He says, the um, Admiral let me just talk for two hours. So I talked about anything that I wanted to for those couple of hours. I was really just trying to show off my intelligence. Then the Admiral asked a series of questions which caused me to realize that I knew nothing about what I had just read. It was very humbling. Right before our conversation ended, Admiral Rickover asked me a very poignant question. He said, when you were in school and in all your previous life up to this date, did you always do your best? I started to say yes, then realized I was not being truthful. I was honest. No, I didn't do my best all the time. When Adam Rickover looked at me with piercing eyes and said, why not? I had to ask myself some questions. Why not? Why not the best? Those questions began to burn in my heart. They became the turning point in my life. Now that young cadet later became the 39th president of the United States, Jimmy Carter. And when he wrote his biography, he titled it, Why Not the Best? He said, that question still haunts me. Am I truly giving my best? Am I truly giving my best? And I think that question should haunt us too. Are you giving your very best to God? Anything less is not letting him be the Lord over your life. It's still you being Lord over your life. If you want to give your very best to God, then you need to live by the three primary commitments of a soldier. One of those is, I must define what I will die for. Until you know what you're willing to die for, you're not really living. The deadest people in the world are not found out in a cemetery. They're the people who do not have something or someone that they're ready to die for. They are the people who are willing to give their whole heart so that others might live. Unless you've clarified what's worth dying for, then you're not really fully alive. Martin Luther King Jr. said, There are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true, they're worth dying for. And I submit to you that if a person has not discovered something that they will die for, he isn't fit to live. Now that might sound, sound pretty harsh to you, but the truth is, unless you're willing to give yourself fully to die for the cause of Christ, if need be, you haven't really discovered the abundant life that Jesus talks about. Jesus also said this, John 12, 24, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so you are made to die so that you might really live. Soldiers know what's worth dying for. Freedom is worth dying for. Family is worth dying for. Faith is worth dying for. There are some things more valuable than my life. Have you determined that dying for Jesus is more important than anything else in your life? J.D. Greer says, he died to turn us into white-hot worshipers and world transformers. He says, Jesus is not a safety net, a relief valve, an assistant or a divine butler. He's a God whose glory and love deserve our utmost allegiance. The cross demands that we either offer our lives to him totally, without restriction, or that we walk away from him in disgust, dismissing him as history's biggest fool. David Platt said, Jesus is worthy of more than church attendance and casual association. He's worthy of total abandonment and supreme adoration. So is your life a worthy response to the gospel, to what Jesus has done for you? Are you willing to give your whole life for him? All of the Family was a popular 1970s sitcom that turned Archie Bunker into a household name. 
In one scene, Archie's son-in-law, Michael, and his wife, Gloria, are in the kitchen. Michael's eating a sandwich while Gloria is baking some cookies. And so Gloria asks Michael, Michael, do you love me? He says, yep, between bites. Would you give up your life for me? Well, he says, right after I finish this sandwich. She says, well, Ma saw this movie on TV, and it takes place in the desert. My husband, or the husband, rather, gives up his life so that the wife can live. I was just wondering, Michael, if you would do the same for me. Sure, honey, if we're ever out in the Sahara Desert, you got my life. Do you got any pickles? She sighs and says, Michael, I'm serious. I mean, if we were stranded out in the desert and we had just enough water for one of us, what would you do? He says, I'd flip you for it. She's exasperated. And Michael adds, well, honey, what do you want from me? I mean, this is a very difficult question to answer. Not many people know how they'd react in life and death situations. She says, okay, forget the desert. Let's say we're out on the ocean and there's a shark coming at us. Would you swim in front to save me? Well, it depends. He says, how, how big is the shark? She says, he's big. He's a man-eating shark. Michael says, well, maybe then you should swim in front to save me. Well, why, she asked. Because it's a man-eating shark. You didn't say it was a woman-eating shark. Well, she's had about enough. She says, I'm just trying to find out how much you care for me. I care for you, honey. Well, if you care for me, if you care for me, Michael says, you'll let me finish the sandwich. Well, she grabs the sandwich out of his hands and glares at him and says, Michael, we're lost in the mountains. This is our only food, our only chance of survival. Would you give me this sandwich? He says, I wouldn't have to because you would take it away from me. Michael, she says, I just want to hear you say you'd give up your life for me. Would you say it? She, ang she angrily walks out into the living room because she's just not getting the response from him. Michael follows her. She looks back at him and says, just say you'd lay down your life for me. Michael says, this is ridiculous. How did we get into this? Just say the words, Michael. Well, he finally gives in. He's worn out by the conversation. All right, I'd lay down my life for you. <laughs> well, you know, that's not really the kind of laying down that Jesus is looking for. You know, he's not going to hound you like Gloria. Jesus said the greatest love is shown when a person is willing to lay down his life for his friends. And so the greatest measure of your love is the willingness to sacrifice yourself for somebody else. The greatest expression is Jesus Christ. The greatest expression of love is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for you. Love is not measured by what people tell you, but, what, but, but by how people sacrifice for you. The greatest sacrifice, the greater the sacrifice, the deeper the love. So how deep is your love for Jesus? Okay, the second thing that a soldier does, they must be willing to sacrifice their comfort. 2 Timothy uh, 2 verse 3 says, Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers do this all the time. They can be out in the field for weeks under all kinds of uncomfortable conditions. You know, extreme heat, very cold, rain, snow, even under attack from the enemy. Soldiers <laughs> give up their schedules. They give up many of their choices. They put up with hardship, hardships because they've already committed to give their lives, if necessary. A sign that you're committed to die is that you're willing to get uncomfortable for the sake of Jesus. You're willing to face hardship for Christ and for others. Ephesians 5.2 says, Live a life of sacrificial love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice for us. So are you dying to be like Jesus. Who are you offering your life for right now? Who are you sacrificing yourself for? Who are you getting uncomfortable for? Who are you suffering hardship for besides yourself? It seems to me that many people think, you know, thank God Jesus died on the cross so that I don't have to. 
A.W. Tozier recognized this when he said, everyone is just delighted that Jesus has done all the sorrowing, all the suffering, all the dying. You know, a, a comfortable faith takes Jesus, but it refuses to take the cross. And I don't think you can do one without the other. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34 and 35, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to lose his life or save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will save it. So what are you losing your life for these days? A third condition that soldiers must be willing to live under is eliminating all distractions. He says in verse 4, here in 2 Timothy, No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. You know, a commanding officer wants your full attention. Now we have part-time soldiers, reservists today, but when you're under the command of an officer, even a part-timer has to give their full attention. Soldiers have to be ready at a moment's notice to do what the commander says. Now most of us have many parts to our lives, but if Jesus is Lord, he still must have your full attention. And so what is distracting you from giving Jesus your best? How are your relationships perhaps keeping you from giving Jesus your best? How are your daily commitments keeping you from giving him your best? How are your habits and entertainment choices keeping you from giving Jesus your best? How is the use of your money and your time and your abilities getting in the way of giving him everything that you have? Now, Jesus doesn't ex expect you to ignore other aspects of your life. What he expects is that you will not allow other things in your life to distract you from giving your very best. So those are the lessons from military. But there are also some lessons that come from sports. Here's how Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. He says, in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a ribbon or a medal that won't last. But we do it for an eternal reward that will last forever. So I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I discipline myself making sacrifices and training my body to do what it should, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear I might be disqualified from the race. So there are three lessons, again, from athletes about being your very best for God. Lesson number one, I must intend to win. If you're going to win in the Christian life, you have to be intentional. Giving Jesus your best is not accidental. Jimmy Carter's life didn't turn around until he got intentional, until he, he was serious to give himself. What efforts are you making for Jesus Christ? What goals are you aiming for in life so that he gets glorified through you? The greatest athletes have more than just good intentions. They're seriously engaged in doing what they need to do to be their very best. So how serious are you about being what God has made you to be? Are you just thinking about becoming a serious follower of Jesus, you know, maybe someday, sometime, in your spare time? Or are you taking him seriously every day, right now, all the time? There's an interesting fact about the human life of Jesus that I came across one time. The Christian apologist Justin Martyr lived in the second century. He said that even then, at that time, he still saw farmers who were using plows made by Jesus. Oz Guinness says, how intriguing to think of Jesus' plow rather than his cross. To wonder what was it that made his plows and his yokes last so long and stand out? <laughs> Do you know what made his plows last long and stand out? It was because he was very intentional about everything he did. He put his whole self into what he was doing at the time because all of his life was given over for God. How about you? Do you intend to win for God in whatever you do? 
Are you serious about being fully engaged with Him? The second thing that we notice about athletes is they discipline themselves. The athletes who really stand out are the ones who don't let their moods dictate their habits. They, they discipline their minds, their bodies, their emotions, and how they use their time to maximize the, themselves so they can be the best they can be at the race. Olympic champion Jesse Owens said, there's something that can happen to every athlete, every human being. It's the instinct to slack off, to give in to the pain, to give less than your best. The instinct to hope to win through luck or your opponents not doing their best instead of you going to the limit and past your limit where victory is always to be found. Defeating those negative instincts that are out there to defeat us is the difference between winning and losing. And he says we face that battle every day of our lives. And so the people who give their very best are champions of discipline. Now this doesn't mean that you ignore taking care of yourself, because God wants you to take care of yourself too. But it's recognizing that the best way to take care of yourself is to give your best for God, even in taking care of yourself. This means disciplining yourself and pushing past your perceived limits into the faith zone, where you have to depend upon God, and where He does His best work in you as you're giving your best effort for Him. Discipline is what gets you across the finish line to where God wants to take you. Then the third lesson that we learn from athletes is I must focus on the reward. That's what keeps an athlete disciplined. It's the prize of winning the race. Now when Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, the prize was uh, you know, a wreath, something that didn't last. Today it's, you know, usually in the Olympics it's a gold medal or silver or bronze, the fame that comes with it, and certainly the satisfaction of winning. All kinds of rewards come from giving your best. And so Paul says, he says, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. He kept his focus on the ultimate reward. When you lose sight of Jesus and being with Jesus in eternity, then the tendency can be to slack off to forget what you're here for. The re reward is not found in anything here or even staying here. The reward is not getting all that the world has to offer you because those are like wreaths. They're, they're perishable. They don't last. So do you know what your reward is? Well, your reward is Jesus himself. Now you can handle a lot of pain in life and endure and discipline yourself when you realize God's purpose for you and know that there's a payoff in the end, the prize of being with God in eternity. That'll be far greater than anything you went through for Him here. So what does it mean to keep focused on the reward? Well, the writer to Hebrews says, Hebrews 12, verse 2, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race that we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that joyful finish with God in heaven. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's here in the place of honor, right alongside God. So we've learned lessons from the military, we've learned lessons from sports, there's a third area that we can learn from, and that's farming. And so this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and following. Remember this, a farmer who only plants a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Then God will generously give all you need, and you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. For God is the one who gives seed to the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will give you many opportunities to do good and will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So what you sow in this life, you reap in eternity. And how you sow says something about what, how you value the seed that you've been giving. Sowing sparingly suggests Giving yourself for Jesus is something that you'll do if, 
if you find the time to do it. But sowing generously suggests that you realize all he's done for you and you can't give back enough for him. So here's the final lesson. To reap a harvest for God, I must plant generously in faith. Generous, generous, generosity <laughs> comes from a heart that's fully in love with God and is willing to do whatever it takes to express love for Him. Generosity is faith stretching itself out for God because you understand how much He stretched Himself out for you. How can you not be at your best when you're living generously for Him? So what needs to change in your life so that you live with distinction and devotion for Jesus Christ. As you give your best for Him, you see, He will stand out in you. Let's pray together. Dear God, when you came, when you sent Jesus, you were giving your very best for us then. And ultimately that was expressed by you pouring your life out on the cross for us. And so today we recognize that what we are really here to celebrate is that you came so that we might be able to live fully and completely in you, to be the person that you called us to be, to live our lives with purpose. But that comes, Lord, as we give ourselves fully to you. And so, Father, today as we look at our lives and we see maybe what's keeping us from giving our best for you, that today we would lay that down before you in full appreciation of, of the life that you gave for us. And Father, we pray that you'd empower us to live our lives in such a way that we fulfill the purposes you have for us in the moment, that, it, that you use us to reach other people for you, and that ultimately it brings glory to you. That is ultimately the best thing we can do. And that's what we want our lives to be about, Lord. And so, Lord, here we are to you, giving ourselves to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.